Hola, hola, my name is Ricardo. I am the host of the Lucha Jovers podcast here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. We are a Spanish speaking show dedicated to discussing and analyzing pro wrestling from all across the world. From AW to CMLL, we talk about American wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and of course, Lucha Libre. If something big happened in the pro wrestling world, we will talk about it. So if you know Spanish or have a friend that knows Spanish or want to practice your Lucha Libre pronunciations, go listen to the Lucha Jovers podcast right here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Nos vemos por ahí. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome back, everyone, to the Gentlemen's Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, as always, Jesse Collings. And joining me here today, first-time guest, he is one of the head main people behind the Wrestling 101 Project on VoicesOfWrestling.com, and he's, in general, a Voices of Wrestling contributor. It's Kevin K. Hare. Kevin, welcome to the show. Ah, oh, Thanks a lot, Jesse. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to finally be on. Yeah, no, this is, and I had had this idea because, um, so the episode today is all about Brian Danielson and Brian Danielson's career. And this is kind of his last year in professional wrestling as a full-time wrestler. I think we'll get into speculation about what that actually means later in the podcast, but I wanted to have you on because, uh, you and I have had a lot of different conversations about Brian Danielson, um, you know, through the the Voices of Wrestling Discord and in a little bit in the Voices of Wrestling Slack. And um, I think you'd be a great guest to have on the show because of your knowledge and your passion for talking about Brian Danielson. Um, and so I thought you'd be a perfect guest for the show. Um, I'll start with, with this kind of question. And I, I have a feeling the answer is going to be different than mine. Um, but can you kind of describe the first time you saw Brian Danielson or kind of what your original introduction to Brian Danielson was? Yeah. So I first really got into the indie scene, um, 2008, 2009. Uh, I knew what ring of honor was, but I didn't. And I was like, you know, I did the normal thing where in high school, I kind of got out of wrestling and then early college as an adult, I started to get back in. But I, I was discovering more of the wrestling, but it took me a little while to actually want to discover the indies more than just like hearing about it. Like I knew the name Ring of Honor, but I didn't go or watch it or seek it out or anything. So around 2008, 2009 would have been uh, when I first started to really dive into that stuff. Um, I cannot remember the exact specific first match that I saw. And this one was not, wouldn't. This was probably not the first match that I saw, but it's the early one that really resonates with me was the uh, PWG match from Guerreras, Guerras and Frontieras. Unfortunately, I, I'm terrible with pronunciations, but it was their big, they did like a kind of Dragon Gate super show um, in August of 2009, either August, or early September. And the main event on that was Danielson's last match in PWG. Um, and now that I think about it, I probably would have seen some matches before because I think he was already going to WWE at this point. Uh, so I, and I, and I knew that he was going and I already knew that he was a great wrestler. So I guess this wasn't that been the first match, but it's the one I kind of remember as being the first one where, um, I don't know if you've seen that one, but it's like, it's, it's Danielson versus hero. It's like 45 minutes. Um, Danielson it's presented as his last match. And uh, in PWG and Hero had been the longtime champion there. So they just go out there and they have a 45 minute classic Danielson hero match. And Hero was the heel. And of course, since it was Danielson's uh, last night there, he was the baby face. And um, yeah, it's just it's just an awesome match. It kind of showcases a lot of Danielson's technical stuff and just when, one of the better things he's good at, which is being the baby face underneath, etc., and uh, yeah, that one really resonated with me. Um, if I had seen matches before that, I, I obviously thought that he was great too, but that's kind of the first one that I really remember of like, wow, this guy is, you know, a different type of wrestler that I haven't really seen before. And if I have seen that type of wrestler before, I haven't really seen him been able to like 
uh, have the leash off or whatever in a way that he did where he could just kind of go out there and do whatever he wanted and, and it all was made sense and led to great matches. Yeah, for me, my original interaction with Brian Danielson is kind of odd, I would say. Like, um, not probably right around the same time as you're talking, like 2008 or 2009, and I was a teenager. And I was starting to get really into, like, wrestling beyond WWE and TNA. I was starting to dabble in watching, like, the indies and wrestling from Japan. And I became, like, really interested in, like, Dave Meltzer and the Wrestling Observer Newsletter and uh, the Hall of Fame and the, and the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Awards. And so I would look at, like, the Wikipedia page that was just, like, list of Wrestling Observer Newsletter Awards. And it would have, like, every, you know, it has every award winner for each category. And I would see this guy, Brian Danielson, who was winning um all of these you know best technical wrestler awards and i believe he won the most outstanding wrestler award several times too and i was thinking about you know who my favorite wrestlers were at that time in like 2008 2009 um and thinking wow like this guy he must be really good like look at him he's won all these awards um but I never, I think I like try to watch some stuff um, by him when he was still on the independents. But back then I wasn't really um, like computer savvy enough as like a 13 or 14 year old to like understand like torrenting and things like that. And I certainly didn't have like money to buy like DVDs. And there really wasn't a lot of him on available, like on YouTube or like on the internet. It's kind of a different era, like that time period, like 15 years ago where. Right. Yeah. Now, I mean, you talk about that and I was doing the bit torn stuff like crazy. I was going insanely hard. Anything I could find. Yeah. I was a bit torn fiend. Yeah. That <laughs> would be later. But like, I'm just like, like to take you back, like I, like you could, if you went on YouTube and typed in like Brian Danielson, like you wouldn't get like full matches like you would now. Um, right, right, right. And, you know, it would take a while for like places like Ring of Honor and other independent promotions to kind of upload a lot of full matches. Um, so I didn't really get like see a ton of him. It wasn't like all those PWG matches were on YouTube. They're still not. Um, and certainly, you know, his Ring of Honor matches weren't on there. So it was kind of hard to kind of understand why this guy was so good because it wasn't easy to find tape of him unless you were like using your credit card to either torrenting stuff or you're using a credit card to like buy dvds from like ring of honor's website and have them shipped to you um so i didn't really see him like regularly wrestle until he was in wwe um yeah yeah i and... did actually now now thinking about it i remember my first actual moment of see of seeing the name was pwg they did a promo with Paul London and him where they're going to be a tag team. And it was just Paul London saying ridiculous stuff. And Danielson just was cracking up and like, could not keep a straight face and was almost like spit laughing. He was laughing so hard. That was the first thing that I ever saw for him. I can remember now that was the first time I ever realized he was a thing. So it wasn't even wrestler. It was a promo from PWG. Yeah. But it kind of sometimes... showed his endearing, like it kind of is the perfect encapsulation of him because they were doing the wrestling thing, but here he is laughing and being Brian Danielson the whole time. So I didn't realize it at the time, but there he is. Yeah. People sometimes I think forget like how goofy and ridiculous PWG was. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. It kind of moved away from that when I would say like a lot of people became aware of what it was and it became, I think more of a, uh, a regular like like um they always had some elements of the comedy stuff like they do like the slow-mo wrestling match at um uh ba battle of los angeles every year but like when like t you know 2013 2014 when the indies were just super loaded like pwg was more of a serious wrestling promotion but like during danielson's time it was a lot of comedy yeah i mean i was i was obsessed with it and my favorite era is 2009 through through 2012 so right before what most people think of when they think of PWG is what I think of when I think of PWG. When they still had some of like the local LA talent instead of just getting rid of all of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And when the, the young bucks rise and 
we'll probably talk well, like one of the things that I really remember from that era since we're talking about it now is that uh, when the Young Bucks turned heel at DDT4 in 2009 and they kind of it wasn't like supposed to happen the crowd just turned on them and the main event from that show was um, Danielson and Roderick Strong because the, the tag team was supposed to be Paul London and Danielson from that promo and London couldn't do it I think he got hurt so it was Strong and Danielson versus the Bucks and the Bucks just abs or sorry Danielson and Roddy just absolutely maul the box Bucks. I don't know if you ever seen that match, but it's kind of crazy because they just like I think the idea was to get to try to make the Bucks more sympathetic, um, but instead they just m- destroyed them. And it was this was like Danielson at his absolute most vicious, his brawling, etc. And they just are going all around the audience, just beating them with chairs and just destroying them. And like, that's like one of the real PWG moments that I really think about is like just that young bucks, Danielson, Roddy match. That is just like uh, an absolute beating. Yeah. And so because my introduction to him was really like, it was like seeing him in like NXT with like, as like the Miz's understudy and that kind of whole angle. And then the Nexus kind of stuff. Um, I, I didn't get it with him right away. Um, because I think a lot of the things that make Brian Danielson such a great pro wrestler were not especially evident during those first few years in WWE. Um, it really wasn't until like I got older and I was like, I started, you know, torrenting like Ring of Honor, um, stuff. And I, I found a torrent on XWT that was, um, like the hundred greatest Ring of Honor matches of all time, uh, and it was, uh, I guess it was, vo- it was like, uh, there was a very comprehensive voting system on some forum somewhere. It might've been DVDR. I don't know where it was, the forum that had it, but someone, someone, you know, they voted, they created a list of the top 100 ring of honor matches of all time. Um, and it was like such an informative moment for me as a wrestling fan, watching all 100 of those matches over the course of like a couple of months, um, just seeing so much different wrestling from ring of honor and just seeing so many different wrestlers and, uh being educated on like non WWE style pro wrestling. And that's where I really saw, you know, all of the best of Brian Danielson stuff. And I became uh much more uh appreciative of of his skill level and things like that by watching that. Cause it really wasn't evident during I think later when he became like a really top star, I think there were it was a little bit more clear like, okay, this is what makes this guy great. But if you go back and watch like his 2010, 2011 WWE stuff, it's like he has some good matches in there, but it's like 2010, 2011 WWE. Like it's not where an, like it's not where a top level wrestler that is as good as Brian Danielson is going to be able to reach his full potential. And I think that's often like I, my main like takeaway from his WWE run other than like him becoming ex- extremely popular with fans but just like it's this neutered version of Brian Danielson so i i have a nuanced nuanced opinion about that i think that uh in some ways you are absolutely correct um obviously danielson there was not the same danielson as uh on the indies and his style was, uh, you know, neutered a bit, tempered a bit. But at the same time, uh, he's so good and he's he's so great at any role that he's able to rise to to the top wherever he is, and he's able to adapt. Right. So, um, especially in the beginning, you're absolutely correct. They didn't really present him first with NXT and stuff, but after that, after the Miz feud and and everything, when he won. But then, then after that, he was just kind of portrayed as a joke or whatever, and 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 didn't really get um, that much shine. And then they had the heel role um, when he when he won the 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 Money in the Bank and then the title in two thousand eleven, and he that was when the no 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 stuff started or whatever. But but the thing is with them is that there is that sure maybe the matches weren't as great, but it really did did it does show how versatile he is and how good he is and how he can adapt to anything. So he has this stuff that 
is not great and he's able to make whatever he's doing matter and work and it becomes like it becomes good because he's able to do it. So you have like the Miz stuff early and like that, that Miz match, I think at night of champions is probably the best Miz match ever. Um, then, you know, you transition to the stuff later, like the champion stuff, you have like the Mark Henry cage match where Danielson becomes the Weasley heel and is just like trying to get out of everything. And, and he's able to do it all within the WWE system. So like, Yes, it is. He's not the same as he would have been on the indies, but at the same time, whatever he's doing there, he's able to make it work within that ecosystem and it's all good. And even if the material was bad, which a lot of it was, he is able to turn it around and make it a positive because he's just so good at adapting and being versatile and looking at the lay of the land as far as what is expected of him, what the crowd wants how things should go and he can make it work with whatever he's doing. So yes, it was not the ideal situation for him. And you could say, yeah, it took away these great years of him, but at the same time, it kind of adds to his legacy adds to his lore. And to me, it showcases how good he is because every single situation he's ever been in, in his entire career, no matter what the obstacle is, no matter what, is expected of him. He's able to overcome it and his just pure talent and both in the ring and knowing what is needed of him in the ring, et cetera, all that stuff is able to just propel him above whatever the situation is. And so I think that that like, that's why I say that it's nuanced because yes, of course it would be great if we had, you know, eight more years of big time ring of honor, new Japan type of Danielson matches, but if we don't have that that WWE era, I don't know if we really get where we are exactly today. So, and and then it just also like you look at his matches, and he's had he's the one person you could say has had matches with like Triple H, Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns, Necro Butcher, Blue Panther, Shingo, Okada, Junakiyama. Like, if you look at his greater thing, like. No other wrestler really has the resume that he has. So I think it yeah, it's it's a wordy way of saying like I, I understand, but I think that it was kind of necessary and it kind of showcases how good he is. There are some elements there that he's like I remember they do this that program you referenced, like he's the he he's the heel world champion and he is feuding with two baby faces really mark henry and the big show so it's like 185 pound daniel bryan versus like the two like most large largest most intimidating men like in the history of pro wrestling essentially um and he's the heel and yet he works those matches and he's like a credible heel where all like traditional wrestling logic would tell you like the little guy cannot be the heel and get the heat fighting these two just gigantic men and yet he somehow manages to do that. Yeah, Big um, Show's bumping for him. Yeah, like there's, there's... I forgot all about that match until you just brought it up. But yeah, Big Show respects him enough and understands the match where he's like taking actual bumps for him. Right, and that's kind of a good example of, I think, the the, the brilliance that he brings to the table. He, um, you know, he's a... um. Like I said, I kind of struggled to understand him when I first saw him in WWE. Not that I didn't know that he was good or I could comprehend that he was good, but didn't really fully comprehend his total brilliance. Um, he is not, you know, he obviously is not a big guy, especially when he was in WWE. He's like the smallest guy in pretty much every match he's in. He's not um, a particularly great athlete. He's not explosive. He doesn't do a lot of um high flying moves and things that make it super obvious like he's not like Rey Mysterio out there where it's like he's small but you can see how good he is because he's so quick um but what what is it about Brian Danielson to you that makes him such a legendary performer like what does he have that just very very few if any wrestlers have 
that have allowed him to have the kind of career that he has and, and been given the kind of praise that he has received? So I think probably the first thing beyond anything else is his charisma, which you probably don't, it's, it's easy to kind of like not think about that, but somebody once told me before, um, like they mentioned the idea of wrestling charisma versus regular charisma, where if you see a guy like Chris Benoit, for example, like maybe he doesn't come off as the most charismatic guy in general, but when he's in the ring, he's doing so much in there and it's so impossible to like, not be enamored by what he's doing with the facial expressions and how he's selling. And he just feels like he's like the center of the universe when you're watching him. And that really is Brian Danielson. When he starts wrestling, he gets, no matter what the situation is, he gets whatever look on his face that he needs and the intensity or lack of it, whatever is there from the beginning. And then uh, when the matches start, He's pretty much everything is able to be laid out in such a logical way, no matter what he's able to do, where um, it it always makes sense. So we're talking about the Big Show stuff. He's able to work with the Big Show and Mark Henry. He's able to work with the guys like The Shield when he was in WWE. And whatever is needed, he's able to do. So like uh, example, we, we've discussed and you and I have discussed quite a bit the idea of the Will Ospreay versus Danielson wrestler of the year uh, discussion from last year. And a lot of people, and uh, I don't even think that this is necessarily wrong. I completely understand it. But a lot of people thought that Will Ospreay had an unbelievable year last year. And he did. He had a great year. He went everywhere he needed to go and and had great matches all over the place. I was always in favor of Danielson having a better year last year because the way that I see Will is that he's able to have a great match with whoever he has a match a match with and he's able to have the great will osprey match with them he's able to take that opponent and bring them up to his level and have that great match wherever he goes and that's impressive um to be able to have a good match with anybody that's impressive i like uh tomu kiro ishii he's one of my favorite wrestlers of all time and that's what he does he's able to have the ishii match with whoever he needs to have it with brian on the other hand He's able to meet his opponent wherever they need to be. So if you look at the type of good matches that he's had in the past year, he had that MJF Iron Man match. He had the Roosh match. He had, um, you know, the Blue Panther match last year, the Eddie Kingston matches, the Ricky Starks match. They're all different and they all require different things from him. And he's able to adapt his skill set to whatever he his opponent needs. And when you watch it, it's still Brian Danielson. Every time you are still watching the same Brian Danielson. It's not like he's out there trying to do cosplay of something else. He's, he's doing Dan Brian Danielson. You, it is unmistakable. That is the wrestler you are watching, but he's able to bring whatever is needed uh, to that match. So Zach Sabre suit junior, he can do the more technical thing. Hedricero this year, he's able to do the technical Lucha thing but for the U.S. audience, Blue Panther, he's doing the Lucha thing, but he's doing it for the Mexican audience. So not only is he doing the heel stuff, but he's presenting it in like the more basic Lucha way where it, as opposed for the U.S., he might be changing the style, watering it down a little bit for the fans to understand there. The, I think the most impressive thing of his year last year might have been that Ricky Starks, Starks match, not just because of how good the match was because the match was unbelievable, but he was able to on two days build, take that match and make it uh, completely intense from the very beginning. Like it didn't feel like the emotion or intensity was like fake or anything. He was able to take that match on, I say two days build. I think it was a day. So he's able to take it on a day, turn it into a match that has real fire, real intensity nothing fake about it and turn it into the best match on the show. One of the best strap strap matches ever. One of the most memorable AEW matches, the match of uh, Ricky Starks life. And this was done on a day's notice. And if it was anywhere else with any other wrestler, you would, people would be complaining like, why does this strap match make sense? Why are they doing this? They're just shoehorning a strap match for no reason. But instead Danielson is so good and is able to bring himself up to the level that the match needed. He's able to bring Ricky Starks there and 
it was an unbelievable match. And I don't even mean to, like, I don't want to say, get an argument about CM Punk versus Brian Danielson or anything, but I honestly feel like the match probably was better off with Danielson on it, even though the build had all been for CM Punk. So um, I think that that just shows how versatile and how much he can do. And, and also going back to it, that's not really his style of match anyway. He's not generally, I mean, he's had many big blood feud type of matches, but when you generally think of him, you don't really think of that bloody type of gimmick match, even though he's really good at them. So I think that that just kind of sums up why he's so good and what he's able to do. I mean, if you look at the WWE stuff, he's able, that was why he got over. He was able to just, bring over whatever the match needed. He made team hell no, which is goofy. He turned it into a real viable thing that was over. And like, again, that's another really strong testament to him. They have this stupid thing where his gimmick is he's a billy goat and he's with Kane, who's at the end of his career is Kane anyway. So he's, you know, kind of one dimensional as a wrestler. And then they take this thing that is really stupid and dumb and Danielson is able to bring whatever is needed for it and made it over. And then that transitioned into the matches with the shield in which they transitioned to like actual serious matches. And then it leads to him main eventing WrestleMania that the next year. So like that's him able to meet any moment and make every movement that he's doing in the ring important and matter is really what is sets him above everybody else. I think. Yeah, I think you mentioned charisma, which I think is a really good point, because I think a lot of wrestling fans have very limited uh, perspective on like what having top charisma is. I think people think of Randy Savage or Dusty Rhodes or Ric Flair, and like those kind of guys are like the epitome of charisma, because it's just popping off the screen when you see right. them, The Rock or Roddy Piper or these people that are just... Terry Funk, yeah, millions. Yeah that are just these captivating figures. And it's like, that's charisma as opposed to you put it as wrestling charisma, which is not necessarily like going to captivate uh, the fans with a 30 second promo, the way someone like Roddy Piper might be able to, but when they're in the ring, understanding kind of what they need to do. And that's something that really stands out with Danielson. When you watch him is, when he's wrestling in the ring, you know, everyone knows he's a great technical wrestler. Everyone knows that his stuff looks good. But, like, his knowledge of when to kind of pick up intensity, when he knows how to beg off, he's a great the guy that really understands how to beg off. Um, I was watching uh, the Nigel mcginnis Brian D. Nelson match from Liverpool, England, uh, the famous kind of unification match between the, the Pure Championship and the, the Ring of Honor World Championship. And... Uh, they do the famous spot where uh, Brian Danielson, you know, yanks Nigel McGuinness's head into the ring post like 20 times. And one of the truly dumbest wrestling spots the last 25 <laughs> years, uh, just an unbelievably stupid decision. Uh, but they do this huge, you know, count out tease where it's like, how on earth is, is Nigel going to be able to possibly get up and count and, and make it to the ring? Uh you know, before the 20 count and, and, you know, Nigel gets in at 19 and Nigel fires up and, you know, they're wrestling in England and Danielson just, he turns and he looks at Nigel and he just, his, he just starts begging off. Like, he's like, I can't believe this guy is up and fired up. What the hell am I going to do? And he puts his hands up and he's like, whoa, 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 man, take it easy. And it's just really great timing. It's like those kind of things that kind of charisma, the knowledge and the ability to kind of sell the story and the action of what has developed in this wrestling match. That's the kind of stuff that is, is I think, not understood by a lot of wrestling fans because it takes kind of an appreciative eye um, to understand it. But he's so, so good at that. I think one of the reasons I don't really like his run in WWE from an in-ring perspective um, beyond the obvious reasons of it being WWE and just the standards for entering work are so much lower is that I really think he's at his best when he is essentially like a bully heel wrestler. He doesn't necessarily have to be like 
this dastardly 100% evil human being heel, but more closer to what he's been like in the Blackpool Combat Club and like his feud with Eddie Kingston and things like that, where he is the the top, you know, letter, letter jacket wearing jockish heel guy. And his ability to be kind of this menacing figure, despite not really being, you know, despite his size, and he was that he that's what he was at his best in Ring of Honor. Um, that's where he's been his best in AW, I think. And in WWE, is either he was the underdog babyface, or he was like the Weasley heel character, and he wasn't able to be the kind of vicious heel, um, or or vicious tweener that he was in Ring of Honor or post WWE. Um, even if you watch like his Blue Panther match. Um, from last week which I watched last night that's the kind of Brian Danielson where he is he's he's not a full-blown like cartoon villain heel but he's this heel leaning guy with these the, just the right kind of mannerisms and understanding of how to work a crowd no matter where that crowd is like you pointed out this was the the, the arena Mexico crowd as opposed to an American wrestling crowd which is different in how you kind of go about your work and how to kind of get the reactions from that crowd and his ability to kind of be able to do that and understand that during a variety of settings, and he's been able to do that for pretty much his entire career, is, is I think, really what makes him great. It's not just the technical wrestling knowledge or things like that that I think he often gets praised for, and rightfully so, but it is that kind of charisma and that understanding of how to just do things when you're in the ring that plenty of other wrestlers that are maybe – close to his level in terms of proficiency in terms of making their stuff look good they don't have and that's what makes him special that makes makes him better than so many of his contemporaries yeah yeah i agree with that as far as like to go back to the wwe stuff i i do agree he was a bit more pigeonholed but still i i do think that there's a little bit more variety there to his stuff there than um what meets the eye like you the Maybe it's not his final match there or anything. He was still there afterwards, but like kind of the crowning achievement is that Kofi match, which I haven't watched it in a while. So, so the specifics of it are kind of lost to my memory, but um, you know, that is the type of where he needed to be. Yeah. The, you're right. The bully that's bad heel. Right. And yeah, so that's closer to and, what I'm talking about. Exactly. And he's, he's able to bring Kofi up to that level. And that whole match is about Kofi, but you need somebody like Brian Danielson there to bring that out. And I don't think it's as legendary or as, you know, good of a match, even if I think the match is awesome, but even if, you know, I know some people aren't as high on it, but I don't think you get whatever that match is without Brian Danielson. And so I, I think that he's perfect there. And, and that run towards the end, I think is a bit like, you know, they had the elimination chamber part and stuff like all that stuff, I think is close to that. But also, I mean, you have stuff like the Brock match there, which is him underneath, but you have the Roman matches, which is kind of him being more the veteran stuff for Roman. And you have the shield stuff, which is he is the valiant baby face there, whatever. But I think if you look at his match resume from WWE, there is more like great matches there than you people might remember just because again, going back to it he's so good that of course he's going to have great matches but i do think one thing um about the versatility that i didn't mention before but you just talking there brought it up and, and reminded me is that yeah he's he's versatile as far as his styles and stuff go but he's unbelievably versatile too on what role he can play in a match he can do literally anything he could be the bully heel he could be the weasley heel he could be the comedy match guy he can be the ace he can be the underdog baby face. He can be the tweener. He can be anything that you need him to be. He can literally do it. And again, going back to what I was saying, it all feels like Brian Danielson. It doesn't feel like he's faking any of it. It just is who he is. He can be the intense brawler. He can do anything and it all makes sense. And so like going back to the match layouts and stuff, he's able to cater his style around whatever his role is needed in the match. Yeah. And I think, you know, just, I, I just, I don't want to keep burying his WWE run, but I, I, have, <laughs> I can't do an episode on Brian Danielson and not mention this. The way commentary treats him 
is so frustratingly annoying that it makes me I'll not agree want to, with that. It That's makes for me sure. like I really struggle to be like, I don't know if I want to go back and watch any of this because I just I can't listen to heal Michael Cole burying him in this obnoxious character or JBL calling him a flying farm animal and doing his JBL shit where he's burying the guy. And it's just, it's absolutely awful. And it makes me never want to watch any of it. Oh yeah. You won't get an argument from me on any of that. I mean, the way they presented him, uh, was it's just bad. so, it's such in this annoying way. Cause you know, you know, deep down, he's the guy, the company never really wanted to push and right. Right. wanted to just use his popularity to try to get some other people over. And Vince right. always felt like he was obligated to push this guy who he doesn't really right. like because the fans get mad and, like it's there's this vindictive edge to it that comes out through the commentary, which is obviously in a lot of cases just the voice of Vince. And right. it, but then it, he was able to overcome all of it because of how good he is. And correct. so go going back, yes, it's all a detriment to some of it. But like I said, uh, I think that it adds to the lore and legacy of him that the, that they have all of this bad stuff there, and he's able to just. He is so good at anything that you need him to do that he's able to become the top guy. And really at the end there, I mean, you know, the goofy uh, vegan belt aside or whatever. The like planet's champion. He's, yeah. He's still able to beat Brian Danielson at the end of the day. Like he still is Brian Danielson there. Like if you look through his career, of course, a lot of the WWE stuff is the goofy stuff, especially the first half. But by the time he's leaving there, he's Brian Danielson. He's just who he is, you know? Yeah, he's so not like, compromised. Right. So, like, he's able to just be the same wherever he is. I I say the same. Obviously, there's differences in how he's working and stuff. But, like, at the end of his time in WWE, he was just Brian Danielson as far as the guy, like obviously his style is way different in AW now when he's at Brian Danielson, but like just when he's leaving his character, everything it's essentially, you can kind of draw a line through everything. He, um, yeah. And, and my last thing, and I don't want to sound like, I, I really don't want this to be me burying Brian Danielson, but I have <laughs> to add one more thing about his WWE run that I absolutely hate is I hate his look. I hate, the long hair and beard and furry little boots, I think, or the kick pads, I think they're obnoxious. And it's not the Brian Danielson that I want to see. You're right in that his character is relatively uncompromised despite all the goofy stuff he's doing. But that's another thing. It's like I go back and watch and it's like Brian Danielson should be uh have a shaved head or or you know a crew cut in no beard. Or I can tolerate his look now where he's got the longer hair, but it's tied up in kind of the man bun. Uh, and he's got the beard. Like, he looks good now. I hate, like, wild man, like, you know, homeless looking, you know, vegan Brian Danielson character that he played in WWE. I just hate that look for him. <laughs> um, but to switch gears into more a more positive light on my end... Um, I want to talk about kind of his his the start of his wrestling career. And I one of the things I did for in preparation of this show was I went back and watched his, you know, match, which is the main event of the first ever Ring of Honor show back in 2002. The era of honor begins. He has a very famous, you know, three-way match with Loki and Christopher Daniels uh, that kind of sets the tone for what ring of honor was hoping to be as a wrestling promotion it's kind of interesting if you go back i'm looking at the card now for that show and oh it's awful it's really there's not, some real bad stuff on yeah there. it's it's really not that good like there's a, there's an amazing red versus jay briscoe match which is like okay that feels kind of in line with what ring of honor would be but the rest of the show is really just a lot of nonsense there is the super crazy versus eddie guerrero match which is part of eddie guerrero's independent wrestling run that he had kind of when he was um, fired from WWE and he's getting over his addiction issues before he would come back and have his huge run uh, a few years later. Right. But and the, this, the famous the famous thing for that show is whether that would have been the main event or the actual main event uh, would have been it because the bigger draw would have been the Guerrero match, but they decided, listen, we want to focus on these new guys going forward, so we're going to put them in the main event over the other match. 
mm-hmm. to set the tone. And obviously that was the correct decision. Right. And in hindsight, it's like, oh, the era of honor begins was a, was a great show that set the tone for what ring of honor would be. And it's like, that's really only true about the main event. Um, yeah. I mean, the first, the first segment in ring of honor history is absolutely terrible. And like the gay heels getting beaten up by the tough New York guys or whatever. Like it's a joke. It's awful. The first and, ever. Like, luckily the main event is so good that you kind of, that's easy to like skate over that. But like, if people saw that first Ring of Honor segment now, they would be appalled. The first ever Ring of Honor match is a one minute tag team match. Yeah, and that's that where the the <laughs> the gay heels come out and they're just like and they get beaten up. It's uh, awful. I believe you're referring to the Christopher <laughs> Street connection of Buffy yes, and exactly. Mace. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> beat up by the Hit Squad of Mafia and Monster Mac. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, if it if that was on a wrestling show now the the pitchforks would justifiably be out big time because like that stuff shouldn't be in wrestling but 2002 i don't know it was a different time it was certainly an independent wrestling it was (laughs) the um but this this main event match which is obviously a a very famous and and match that i think a lot of people have probably seen if you haven't seen it it's right on youtube you can watch it whenever you want you know low-key uh brian danielson who's going by the ring name american dragon which i want to get to in a second and christopher daniels and what is is really interesting about brian danielson when you go back and watch you know 2002 he's 20 years old he's only a few years into his career and if you're able to find some stuff that predates that like his stuff from 2001 or 2000 um which is much harder to find uh certainly there's not a ton of it on youtube um but if you go back and watch it what is very interesting to me about it is not only of how good he is because he's already great he's just he probably doesn't get enough credit for being and it's because it was so low profile but when people talk about um kurt angle or i know a lot of people talk about logan paul or you can go back and talk about someone like like jumbo saruta but junakiyama yeah we talk about guys who are just like instantly amazing pro wrestlers pretty much right out of the gate and how impressive that is he isn't in that conversation because he wasn't wrestling in front of a lot of people and it was a lot of that stuff's not on tape um as opposed to all those other guys that we just mentioned that are all wrestling you know debuting with major wrestling promotions he's so great just from the 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 start it's almost it's almost like like eerie how fully formed he is as a pro wrestler yeah, and I think that's it, right? The first time people see him is uh, the Super 8 tournament and like that, uh, the Ring AP, of Honor show. The APW, best of the best, of the, is it was yeah, best we, of the Indies, King of the Indies, whatever that show was. Yeah, that was whichever one. Yeah, yeah, impetus yeah, yeah. for the launch of Ring of Honor. Yeah, yeah. So, like, um, whatever, whichever tournament that was, he was so good right away and so fully formed that he was, he never had the like prospect uh, era of his career, right? Like, he came in. And he was just right away, this is the future of wrestling. And it was presented as this is what's next, but it was it was presented in a way of like, this is what's next because these guys are here right now and are doing it. And if you do not get on the train right at this moment, you're going to miss it. So like he never had the, oh, look at this guy who's debuting and he's a real blue chip prospect. Let's see what he does in his future. It was, no, this guy is here right at this exact moment. And if you do not catch him right now, he's going to be like, you're going to miss it. So you're right. He was fully formed right away and right very uh, quick in his Ring of Honor career. He becomes the, the not the ace per se, because he's not the ace, but he co- becomes like the top wrestler. Like this guy is the best wrestler in the world. If you think you're the best wrestler in the world, you're going to have to go up against this guy who's not necessarily a regular because pretty soon in the Ring of Honor starting, he goes to New Japan and stuff comes a lot. So he's presented as like, he's not presented as a complete visitor, but he's also not presented as a full-time member. So he's kind of the incoming guy that is around every once in a while. And when he's around, he's presented as that, like, this guy is the best in the world. You're going to have to beat him to be, also one of the best guys in the world and that's another thing that i'm thinking about is like so in 2002 
he's presented as one of the best wrestlers in the world. And now we're at 2024 and he's also one of the best wrestlers in the world. And how many wrestlers, like we can talk about longevity and stuff of wrestlers. And, and there are many wrestlers that have had long careers and that type of thing. But how many wrestlers in 2002 be, can be at least presented as one of the best wrestlers in the world, whether he was or he wasn't, of course, that's up for debate, but, but that's how he's presented. And then now 22 years later, He's still presented the same way, and you believed it in 2002, and you believe it in 2024. And I think that is just his, you know, it's just a testament to how great he is. Like, he came out of nowhere as 21, and he's immediately credible. He's 20 years old in this match. Yeah, yeah. That he has. And, um, yeah, like, he he's – He's better in like 2006, 2007 than he is in 2002. Of course, yeah. But he's not like that much better. Like, no, it's it's all logical progression, right? He's so great at such a young age. Uh, and it really hammers home because it's not only, you know, it, it, he's in this match, but, you know, Loki who wins the match. Um, and Loki, who's not that much more experienced than Danielson, he only has three years of experience as opposed to Danielson, who has two years of experience by the time this match really rolls around. Like, he's also extremely good. And Christopher Daniels, who has more experience, um, obviously had wrestled, you know, for about almost 10 years at that point. Uh, but it got me thinking about, like, and, and you can point to this other guys on the show, like Amazing Red and Jay Briscoe. Um, and even, you know, guys like Roderick Strong and, and some of these other guys that would come into Ring of Honor over the next few years. Um, these guys are so good from the jump. And I just kind of wonder how and why that was. Because subsequently, it didn't – this seems like a, a, a kind of a strange time, like the early 2000s, to have a bunch of wrestlers – in their early 20, late teens, early 20s, who were already extremely good pro wrestlers with really a minimal amount of, of matches, um, experience that in a lot of cases was limited to working local indies in front of not particularly a large amount of fans. And, you know, even as the indies became more robust and there became more places to work and... Um, you know, as we get further into the 2000s, it still feels like there was like, it would take years for guys to really break through. Even as we get, you know, into the indie boom period in in the mid to 2010s, it's still like if a guy only had one or two years experience, they'd be, he would still be considered like a prospect. They'd be like, oh, they've still got a lot more room to grow. And be, I don't know if it was just because indie wrestling kind of was starting from ground zero at this point. Um, you have the collapse of ECW and WCW, you know, no one really specifically with ECW kind of lo losing ECW as kind of the, the top indie, for lack of a better term, in that scene and kind of being like, OK, where is the next direction of independent wrestling coming from? And it ends up being this Ring of Honor match uh, in, in Ring of Honor in general. But. It, I, I just don't kind of understand. It's very interesting to kind of study, I guess how so many good wrestlers were ready to be like main event, credible guys that are as exciting as anyone else in the world, despite really lacking the experience. And while yeah. I think it's fair to point that, you know, Brian Dielson's one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. So it's it kind of makes sense for him to have picked up this kind of savant level wrestling ability right away. It, that can't be the only explanation because there are a lot of other guys that are, that are also excellent, excellent pro wrestlers with only a few years of experience. I think it's a, it's absolutely an interesting thing when you've been talking about it. I've just been trying to pull my thoughts together and kind of think about why. And a, a few – some of the things that I thought about just now were regionalism where um, a lot of stuff there's – you know, now you can watch indies from anywhere and it's easy. But back then it wasn't happening as much. So guys were able to, um, you know, wrestle in their home areas a little bit, get a little bit refined and then – Ring of Honor was like the melting pot where they had the luxury of being able to pick these guys from everywhere. And so the best you could bring in the best guy who hasn't really been exposed overexposed too much and bring him in there. And he can, you know, have 
those great matches or w- seemingly great because people hadn't seen them before. The other thing too is like you have to remember a lot of the guys. It's a, it, it's easy to look back in hindsight and think about these guys being great wrestlers and they're just in the normal wrestling lexicon. But a lot of them are in like the Benoit Guerrero model where they're shorter guys and they're not as big as what WWE was wanting. And WWE, this was the era of John Cena and Batista and Brock Lesnar and all that stuff. So they weren't like going to WWE was never really that much of a, of a possibility. Like Danielson was there early in his career. Omega was there early in his career, but like none of them did anything and they left because they looked at the lay of land and they're like, this is not really what will be successful for me. So like, it wasn't what was wanted, what WWE wanted. So you have these guys where now they would be picked up immediately by every company. As soon as like example, like Brian Keith, who isn't even necessarily at the level of some of those other guys, but like, He's there and he doesn't even get a chance to really to go that hard on the Indies because somebody picks him up right away where there, they kind of had no choice. And then also we're talking like 2002. So this is like the, the right after the absolute peak of wrestling. And so you have all these kids that were teenagers in 96, 97, 98, 99, and they want to become wrestlers. And that's the era that, they're going to be a wrestler in 2002, 2003. So wrestling is so popular that of course, a lot of these guys that are more athletic are going to start wrestling then, and they're going to pick up on things. And it might be stone cold, Steve Austin and the rock, but they also might've been watching Dean Malenko and the Lucha guys or whoever in, in WCW. And that might've been Chris Benoit, Eddie, like, and they see those guys and they're like, that's who I want to be. So I feel like it was just kind of a perfect storm of lack of exposure to these smaller places, more people wanting to get into wrestling um, and their style, not really being what was in the major company at the time. So there had to be a other place for all these guys to congregate. Yeah. I definitely think that um, part of it is the, the in-ring style, especially with, you know, ECW goes down, WCW goes down, so you lose, you know, for for all the criticism late stage WCW gets, which is obviously quite a bit, the, WCW would just roll out guys and let them do stuff. Like they there's, you know, they 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 signed AJ Styles um at the very, very end, like months, I think, before his career um before the company folded but like wcw would get guys and they'd roll them out and they would let them do whatever moves they wanted to do and and short matches that were on thunder or somewhere else and you know wcw goes away ecw's gone you're left with just the wwf in ring product and that's a really like turgid product it's not anything like what you're seeing on the indies especially when you talked about you know, where you're seeing smaller wrestlers that are doing wrestling a different style than the WWE house style. And I think that's a big thing. And one of the things, you, when you go back and watch these Ring of Honor shows, the, the Ring of Honor crowds from like 2002 to like 2008 or nine are, I think, my favorite wrestling crowds in like the history of our wrestling. Probably my favorite American wrestling uh, uh, crowds by far because they are so... They are knowledgeable and passionate about that style of pro wrestling in a way that I think um, would get lost in subsequent generations of fans. Like the AEW audience is generally very good as well, but the AEW audience has, you know, WWE influences and they've also kind of seen it all. So things don't stand out. When you go watch some of these 2002 Ring of Honor matches, you know, they'll do a spot. I think there's a spot in the low-key uh, Danielson Daniels match where they do, like, you know, a power doom spot with the, the superplex and then someone doing the power bomb at the base. And, like, the crowd loses their minds because that just wasn't something you saw all the time. And right. and that... I, I think one thing, one thing, too, they have to remember is that not only was it reactionary against uh, WWE, but it was reactionary against ECW, which – was you know the garbage wrestling and stuff right before that and ring of honor is the direct you know descendant that's next i mean i think that there's a str- there's a, a strong possibility that ecw eventually becomes what ring of honor 
turns into at least style wise. But like that's another thing that the reaction is like, you know, you had stuff like awesome and in, in Tanaka and the Eddie stuff from uh, ECW, but like Ring of Honor is kind of focusing on that stuff and not the other well, stuff from ECW. They would have from... Ring of Honor would eventually start focusing on that if we go right. back to the original <laughs> Ring of Honor card. Uh yeah, I, I okay. So what I was gonna say and I debated saying it, but like they presented themselves as the alternate, even though they were doing some of the stuff that is real seeped in ECW. <laughs> yeah. And I think um there wasn't yeah, they they just the crowd honestly just I miss this in wrestling. I understand why it was a time and place thing. I, I'm going to sound like a, a much older person because it's like all nostalgia for me. But I just miss the era of indie wrestling where the fans would see a cool move and they would just lose their shit. Yeah, like, yeah. I understand that's kind of like a cheap version of pro wrestling. Like you got to make the fans feel and react to something like real and not just watch them do a cool move. But there's nothing quite like watching that Ring of Honor crowd and just – like they see a big high spot and they all just stand up and go, Wah! Oh, like right. it's such a fun environment for pro wrestling. I love watching it. It's one of the reasons I think I enjoy going back and just watching that era of pro wrestling as kind of my favorite um, type of pro wrestling because it was respectful. It was appreciative of different styles of wrestling and they just loved seeing pro wrestling. And right, right. I, I, I think audiences today, especially like the AEW audience is, is a little more, has too much variety to kind of capture that. There are a lot of those same kind of people that are going to be into that, but there's also the, you know, the WWE influence and, and people that are going to demand constant spoon fed stories and, and, and the kind of the WWE brain nonsense that we talk about all the time. Right. But it's that just, you know, in, positive enthusiasm for quality professional wrestling and when they got it they were just you know happier than pigs and shit and right. i i think that's just kind of lost it's just and, and um it it helps make i think brian danielson if you go back and watch like his peak work from that era ring of honor so much better where it's like brian danielson's just gonna wrestle this guy and it's it's not only is Brian Danielson great at working the crowd and things like that, like we talked about earlier with his charisma and his ability to kind of get messages across to the audience, but the audience is just pitch perfect for that style of pro wrestling too. And that's what I think makes it so special. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree with that. And, and one of the things that you mentioned um, a few minutes ago was about the idea of, you know, of course that he was better in, in 2006, 2007 than in the, in the 2002. And I absolutely agree with that. But I think the one thing is that 2002, 2003, 2004, he wasn't around ring of honor and he didn't really just get the opportunity in ring of honor to be what he was in 2006. Mm -hmm. Whereas like he might've been that right away. But since like I saying, he was kind of like a, in he was there and he wasn't there. Like he never really, uh, sunk his teeth in and maybe it, he needed those few years in the wrestling business i'm not i'm not uh uh debating that or doubting that or anything but like just like he might have been there right away but then a, it took a few years and then really the charisma stuff comes really comes out and the outwardly you know promo charisma and stuff and i at least i agree with you like that 2006 2000 era 2007 era of danielson is absolutely his best uh indie era before he goes to wwe i mean even like the ring of honor stuff is unbelievable and you know there's great matches in there and, and there's also stuff again that shows his versatility of where he's able to like bring delirious up to a great you know a at least in that night delirious feels like he's a realistic uh title contender and i i think that that is an era of his career that has a lot of you know, that, that's when he's a little too over ambitious sometimes and he tries to do too much. I mean, you have that like, what is a 75 minute long Austin Aries match, which isn't very good. And there's, well, that's, there's... that's that's one of the main criticisms I think you'll see from him in this era, which is like, yes, he became kind of obsessed with like match length, which right. is like, and like being and... the Iron Man and having this epic match where you're just selling exhaustion and um 
it's kind of predictable and easy to see from like a guy who's an artist that's pushing the boundaries of what is ha people are seeing in pro wrestling, which is like, let's go out and give these fans a match that is just longer than anything else they've ever seen before. And right. that's, that's and a challenge and that's an artistic endeavor. I do think that like sometimes his, like he gets summarized like that. And it's like, does he have some, like, does he lay, does he lay some eggs because the matches are going too long? Yes. But my God, he has so many great matches that you can't, oh. it, it's kind of pointless to focus on the times, like that, that famous Aries match that you said, where it's just like something didn't click and they had a bad creative right. idea. Right. But I think one, so one other thing, and, and I don't want to keep, uh, you know, you don't want to keep bringing the negative of the WWE and I don't want to keep trying to uh, whitewash it and, and make it seem like it was only a positive thing. But one positive thing, I think, from the WWE run, and it's hard to say if this is because of WWE or it would just be him getting older, et cetera. But I do think that being in WWE, kind of afterwards, his style is a bit more streamlined where he's not going for those big epic things as much anymore. I mean, some of that might be the TV role and stuff. But even if you see him outside of it, I think that it did kind of streamline his style a little bit. Uh, in a positive way where he's able to just focus on the meat and potatoes. So that could be a positive from the WWE run. Like I said, maybe that is just getting older too. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like, I mean, that, that heel ring of honor stuff is so great. Like in the cage of death match, which I think is one of the greatest matches of all time. And it's probably the, in my opinion, it's the best ring of honor match of all time. The CZW uh, versus ring of honor cage of death match. Yes. Yes. That one, uh, his role in it is like, pretty minuscule as far as the greater story but and he doesn't wrestle too much in it but he he's he's unbelievable at making you think that yes the heel he is a heel but ring of honor matters more to him than being a heel so he's going to set it aside and he'll do whatever and he's still going to be the dickhead uh brian danielson but he'll put it aside and then at the end of the day he just attacks joe anyway and he's flips off everybody and leaves the match and uh and then sets the stage for homicide to come in and then sets the stage for the homicide Danielson stuff where you know they they kind of uh he got hurt and and they kind of didn't stick the landing or they didn't they stuck the landing they a lot of the stuff before that they they kind of lost some steam but then in that match he's exactly what he needs to be and he's the perfect foil for homicide to become champion and and does it work against anybody else? Maybe, but it was Danielson who was the guy who had had to work it for, and and he does it perfectly. And then, again, a testament to how great he is, he he transitions that stuff into the McGinnis stuff and all the that great stuff from that year. He transitions it to going against Morshima, where he's still in the beginning of the Morshima feud. He's kind of like a still dickhead Danielson, and by the end of it, uh, he's the most sympathetic guy in the company. He's battling through a, a broken orbital bone. He's bloody and he's getting beaten down by this big bully guy. And it ends in, you know, one of the better blow offs the company has had with uh, that final battle 2008 match. Mm -hmm. So like he's able to just transition right from being the heel guy to being sympathetic baby face. Uh, Brian Danielson, he comes out, uh, on top at the end and, and again in a bloody vicious brawl against uh Morshima in, in uh Hammerstein. So there you go. He he transitions from being heel cocky Danielson to being sympathetic Danielson. You can buy it all. What do you think about his name being like he he goes by American Dragon like that's his actual rig name early in his career. It's not just a nickname. He's American Dragon. He's referred to as American Dragon. Um, and he he got that name over despite it kind of being absurd and stupid. Uh, it's a different era of 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 wrestling. And you know I get it. He's like a teenager and he's like yeah I'm gonna go by the name American Dragon. And despite the fact that. Uh, unlike pretty much any other dragon in pro wrestling, he's not wearing a mask. Um, I don't think anything about his size or wrestling style would indicate like dragon like. Uh, oh, I think he did wear a mask very early on. Oh, I think I, I actually think you're right. I can picture him wearing the yeah. sweatpants and wearing a mask. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 he he, he got it's still it's it comes it's a great nickname now. Um, it is 
uh, something that is still over. And I think it's almost a testament to him that he can walk into a 2002, you know, Philadelphia, New York City wrestling market with some, you know, famously cynical fans as this 20 year old kid. And he's going by the name American Dragon, which is, again, like kind of an obnoxious and stupid name if you think about it. And it doesn't matter. He's instantly over and people think he's cool. That's almost like a yeah. testament to his ability more than anything. I would agree to that, but I think in not just in wrestling, um, but just in a lot of mediums, right? Any any name or any move or anything is kind of a blank slate, especially in wrestling. You say move, where um, we've had we've had this discussion too about specific moves with Danielson, where I think that in wrestling the biggest thing is making people buy in, right? And and you buy in by being going back to the, what we were talking about charisma. You buy in by charisma and what the guy is presenting and uh, who he is in the ring. And everything else is a blank slate that is, you know, drawn on by that charisma and who the guy is. So his name, sure, it's goofy, but then you see him work and all of a sudden you go, oh, yeah, American Dragon. That makes sense. Now, does it make sense? No, of course not. Or it might, it might not, whatever. It doesn't matter. But the guy's able to just like, He's presenting this blank slate name, and you're able to associate all of the positive, um, uh, like all of the positive things about that guy to that name, and then it's almost good that it's goofy, or almost it's almost good that it's not associated with anything else, because then it becomes that's him, you know. And it's same like with music, where so many band names are stupid, but or they don't mean anything, but then because they just are just, you know, so boring and basic. You're able to take that name and associate it with the band, only the band, and it kind of helps them in a way where it just creates their persona because this name doesn't mean anything. Like finishing moves in wrestling, we've talked about the knees, um, Danielson's finisher, whether it's good or not. To me, when I watch a, a wrestling match, I'm not the type of guy that cares as much what moves look like. Um, of course I want them to look good. I'm not saying that they, I'm not trying to give guys a pass if stuff doesn't look good, but to me, what's really important is what the mat, what the move means and where it's laid out in the, in the match and, and the gravitas behind the move. And I'm able to kind of turn my brain off a little bit about if it looks great or the logic of the move, because it's wrestling. None of it, like it's all goofy, you know, like, if if you really uh, focused on what was goofy on wrestling, you wouldn't be watching it. Yes, so, the Irish whip is a very goofy move. Right, exactly. So like, I'm able to just be like, this is the move. I think of the move as a blank slate, and all that matters is like what is behind the move, what it means. And so like, I think that in general, like that's a testament to him is he's able to take these things that maybe by themselves don't make sense or are silly or whatever. And he's able to just put himself behind all of that stuff. And he makes it matter because it's him and he gives meaning to it. And that's kind of another testament to how good he is. I wish the knee looked better. <laughs> yes. I, I didn't want to like, uh, you know, turn that into a full argument. And I understand that, but like, that's how I'm able to justify like, sure. It could look better. I wish it looked more like the V trigger than the Kenton knee. Um, but whatever it is, what it is, and I can buy it. And also with him, he the the fact that he's able to finish matches different ways. Uh, I I'm able to you know maybe the knee works, maybe it doesn't. Maybe he'll finish it with the L- L- bell lock. Maybe he'll finish with you know. He, we didn't even mention that one of the peak things that he was able to do in Ring of Honor is turn the s- small package into a viable finish and a gimmick. And, you know, it it's it's kind of like a generic Danielson point at this point where people mention that. But, like, he was able to do that. He took this simple move that everybody has seen a million times and has never thought about as an lo- actual uh, viable finishing move and – he's able to turn it into something that gets real and gets real reactions and gets real, um, you know, it turns into his persona and it's just a silly small package that people have seen a million times. Yeah. I love that stuff. I loved when he would do, I don't think he really does it anymore, but I love when he would just do like, he would just do three straight scoop slams. 
that was like a signature move that he would do in a lot of his Ring of Honor matches where he's just like, I'm going to pick a guy up and I'm going to give him a scoop slam. And then he's going to get up and I'm going to give him another scoop slam. And I'm going to give him, it's like basically the three amigos, but scoop slams. Right. And it right. got over it. It's like, again, it was almost like this challenge, which is like, what is the most basic thing I can do? And can I get it over? And the answer with Brian Danielson is almost always yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's able to do whatever he wants. And, and like, that's, Again, it, we talk about it. He, a wrestler has a blank slate. So however he wants to fill that in, if you can make it work, you hypothetically can make it work. And whatever he does, whatever he tries to do, he is able to do. I mean, he's like an unbelievable comedy wrestler. He never has to do it. But when he does do it, he's like great at it. And he's like whatever he needs to do, he's able to to do whatever role like if he decides like oh i'm gonna add these easter eggs in these matches and like you know start doing william regal moves or whatever like all that stuff he's able to do it it all makes sense it all feels logical like he's just it his match with kenny omega and pwg is like completely comedy match and it's like good and people say like oh i I wonder if they wrestled before it's like oh don't watch that match because (laughs) it's good but like it's not what you want like before their AW match, of course, it's not what you're thinking, but like they're able to just do, he's able to just do whatever he wants and it always works. So this is supposedly the last year of his, his full last full-time year of his career. And this year so far in 2024 has given off the Im- impression that he's kind of doing all of these bucket list things because he says this is his last full-time year in wrestling. We've seen him wrestle for New Japan. We've seen him wrestle in Arena Mexico. We've seen him kind of do all of these things that he said he's going to be able to do uh, and wanted to do before he goes into like what he has called like this Johnny Saint period of his uh, wrestling career where he plans on wrestling, but he's not going to wrestle uh, like weekly on television. He's not going to be a staple uh, that you see all the time. And to be great, to be fair, I think, that I don't personally see that as a total difference between what he's been doing the last few years than what he than what um he plans on doing in the future. I think part of it is injuries have kind of kept him out of the ring uh for portions of his AEW run, which have made uh him a less frequent wrestler uh than he has been like in this year. Like I, I and and, he's, and here's the thing with that he's, he's wrestled like... Almost like he's wrestled 16 matches this year and he wrestled 29 last year. So, yeah, I mean, who knows how much he was actually hurt, too? Like, yeah, he probably was hurt, but I I don't mean to to say he wasn't, but you know, it's wrestling. Mm -hmm. Like at this time last year, he had only wrestled eight matches. So, he's wrestled twice as many matches already as he has last year. Um, and hopefully he can stay healthy because there was a period during his AW run. Um, knock on wood and everything like that, where it did feel like it was like, man, he's so good, but he just, he keeps getting hurt. You know, he hurt his eye. He, um, so the eye is the one that I'm a little dubious on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, but either way, you know, he broke his arm in the, Okada, right, he broke right, his right. forearm in the Okada match. And it was like, his work is so good, but he's getting a little CM punky where it's like, can his body hold up to like consistent work? And so far so good. He's been working a lot, uh, in yeah. 2024, um, but what do you make of kind of like this being his last year as a full-time wrestler? Like how serious do you take that as a Danielson fan? Cause I'm kind of not taking it that seriously. I think he's still going to be around in wrestling prominent matches, uh, in the future. Um, and they've, they're not really advertising it super hard. This isn't like Danielson final bye-bye or things like that. How do you, what do you kind of make of that as a fan? Just him, this being his last full-time year, allegedly. Well, Fantasy booking, I'm hoping that this is all a ruse and that at some point he just has a complete unhinged turn of like, yeah, I lied. I, I'm going for the title. Um, that Rick, would be a Ric Flair like, I'm not retiring. Literally, you can't retire me. No, well, the Rick, the Terry Funk versus Ric Flair of like the, oh, sorry, sorry, Rick, sorry, Rick. And then uh, Brian Danielson is the is the Terry Funk in this situation. Yeah, just, just literally should reshoot. Unhinged. Just reshoot yeah. the the angles shot for shot. Like have Brian yeah, Danielson exactly. be a judge of, of a title match. Oh yeah, I, I played the whole thing in my head about him versus Will Ospreay at Wembley, how it would work. But I won't uh, divulge too much into the fantasy booking right there. But but like uh, but yeah, I I think I I don't even 
I, I've thought about this a lot and like part of me thinks that like, okay, they, they wouldn't be like, he, he really does believe this and that like, it would be, they wouldn't lean as into it as they would. Although, you know, they haven't said final year as much recently, but like, because, you know, with the way that TV is these days, it's so basic that like how like TV wrestling, it's like, okay, if you're doing this tour on TV and you're saying that it's his last year, then when it's not his last year, like, if he, how does he still pop into AW after that? You know, like, uh, if it, it kind of feels to me that like, there's a good, unless this is an angle aside, which, you know, fantasy booking aside is possible. Um, unless it's an angle, like how I don't really, I feel like he either has to go away at least for a, a year or two after that, or he goes, you know, just does the worldwide tour or he goes back to WWE for like just a late stage. Like I'll be able to come in and do WrestleMania if I want to and do whatever else. Um, he does come across as a guy who has the wrestling bug. I mean, like that's turned into his gimmick at this point, but you could just see it. We, you watched that blue Panther match last week and the man was having the time of his life. Like he, you could tell that it's just ingrained in him. Like it's what he thinks about. It's what he wants to do. So like he's still going to be involved somehow. And it doesn't seem like he really wants to be a trainer or a coach or an agent too much. I mean, I'm sure that he does that stuff, but like it, I don't get the impression that that's what he wants his career to be. It feels to me like when he's done wrestling, he won't like when he's wrestling, he likes that role, but I don't know if he, really wants to do it when he's not wrestling. So I don't know. I, I kind of been thinking that like, if this really is that bucket list run and it's done for him, then not even to be like an alarmist thing or whatever, it feels like WWE would be what makes sense for him. But I really don't know. I mean, he wouldn't be able to have, it does seem like he's having so much more fun now than he would if he was there. So I really, I don't know. It's a lot of words to say, I don't know. He might be done. He might not be. I don't see him stop wrestling, but it's hard to see him staying in the AW after this. So I, I really just have no idea, but he feels like a guy that is going to be wrestling as long as he can, even if it's just once or twice a year. Yeah. And he's basically said that as much. He's basically said that he plans on wrestling infrequently. This is his last year as like a full-time wrestler. And I, I just, I like as a fan, like, if he's wrestling seven matches a year, is that really that big of a difference? If he's still, right. if he's still wrestling high profile matches, which I imagine he would, like if he, if his one of his seven matches a year was like an indie date or he was like, yeah, I'm going to wrestle this rampage match against Trent Beretta. I think it would feel different, but we know as you know, it's very clear. He's still wrestling at a super high level. So if we're, if those matches are still going to be major matches, whether they're in AEW, new Japan, CMLL elsewhere, I don't think there'll be a huge difference. You might not see him as a television character uh, all the time. Um, right. Like you kind of do now, but. But like the Undertaker was retired for a decade before he retired, right? Like he was, and and they they able to make it where you knew he was going to have one match a year. Yeah, I mean. And it worked and you look forward to it. I mean, in real time, it doesn't hold up for me as much now, but in real time, I was all in on the streak stuff. Like it was my favorite thing in wrestling. Mm -hmm. So you could do something like that. I mean, Roman Reigns has been retired for years. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about that. Um, right. Is there anything you want to see? Let's, let's just, let's take this at face value and just say like, this is his last, he's got, you know, uh, eight months left as a full-time pro wrestler, like, are there things that you want to see? He's done some of the major stuff. Like he, he wrestled the Tokyo Dome. He wrestled at arena Mexico. He had the blue Panther match. Are there, are there things that you want to see him do um, in the la next eight months uh, before he, 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 you know, stops as a full-time wrestler? So, I mean, the big AEW dream match that I would say was Osprey, but they're doing that next week. So, yep. That's obviously like that would be the big AW thing. Um, I don't know. It, it's so hard when you when you think about it. It's like he's done so much of it, either recently or just in general in his career. I mean, of of course, the big mask match in Mexico would be awesome. Uh, 
Mystico put, put it on Twitter about, oh, let's do the mask match. Now, of course, I don't believe one iota that that'll actually happen. But if that were to happen, a big match like that would be, you know, unbelievable. Uh, as you know, and I, as people, if you if you interact with me in any of the Voice of Wrestling forums or anything or he- heard when I was on Burning Spirits before anything, I'm a bit of a sicko. So I would love to see some big, bloody blood feud from him and because i think he's really good at that stuff and and i think that it would be and any extra stuff we get like that would be awesome i like if they go back to the hangman danielson well and have like a texas death match there i think that that would be awesome but as far as like even like dream match stuff it it's hard to even think about some of that stuff because he's done so much of it like if you look at uh the u.s who's left that he hasn't wrestled i mean cody really like at least this form of cody he hasn't wrestled he didn't wrestle uh this form of cm punk but really like almost everybody else he's wrestled and and, like you could say like okay i can accept that as like the match with brian danielson against this guy like i would have liked to see a, a major ray mysterio feud but we're past that now like i think that's one thing that wwe dropped the ball on um but like japan he's wrestled almost everybody over there i mean it would be nice to see him wrestle i guess there's the other new japan guys who has in like a guy like kento miyahara would be fun nakajima now this form of nakajima against brian this form of brian that would be awesome so there's some stuff there i mean the sicko and me would love to see June Kasai versus Brock Danielson, even though it doesn't really make any sense. I like well, he'd if make it work. Could make that happen. He would make it work. I mean, June Kasai would make it work. He would make it work. It would be awesome. Uh, so, so that's kind of a you know off the wall type of thing. But like in general, too, like let's say if he didn't do any of this stuff, he's done so much of it where like I feel content with his career, even if he's not. But like I guess the biggest thing would be a big mass versus ma- a hair match in Mexico because it's something that feels really feasible and would be like, you know, unbelievable and the stakes would be there. You felt that last week in that match and there weren't those mask stakes stakes. It was just him in arena Mexico. So I think that would be awesome. And, and of course there'd be no better than Mystico to do it against. And you'd think, like his hair is a bit ridiculous right now. I was so gonna say would it would get us been... back to crew cut Brian right. Danielson, like I was talking about. And you'd think that he's probably subtly been doing that on purpose. So uh, because the man is always thinking about that type of thing. So like I think that you know that that seems feasible, but otherwise, I have Brian Danielson versus Nick Gage and GCW, that would be awesome. But uh <laughs> that would take a lot of effort. I would yeah. Like this stage of Nick Gage's career, yeah, it would have been better <laughs> five years ago, Nick Gage. But even like two or three years ago, like, like when yeah, when yeah, Gage yeah. was really um, pre, doing a lot pre pre pandemic knee injury, Nick Gage. Yeah, um, but you know, Danielson would probably make it work. I mean, that would be just a like most Nick Gage matches. That would just be a vibes match. Like, oh would, yeah, it absolutely. would be okay if Nick Gage like didn't take any back bumps. The exactly, um, yeah. I of course really really want to see him wrestle Nigel again. Yeah. Um, that is my like white whale dream match. Um, everyone that's ever interacted with me knows that I'm like probably like one of the biggest Nigel enthusiasts uh, uh, on on in in wrestling media. I like him more than Danielson. Danielson obviously has a better peak, uh, or Danielson obviously has way more matches and a way richer career than Nigel McGuinness. But like, if I'm t- asking like one Ring of Honor guy whose matches I want to watch at their best, I love Nigel so much. I want to see him squash Brian Danielson at Wembley Stadium <laughs> uh, to settle that once and for all. I I I, earn, I honestly believe that we're going to do that last year, and. They didn't because Danielson was hurt. He hurt himself at, at, during the Okada match, and he wasn't ready for Wembley. And I really hope they're going to do that again this year, um, which obviously Nigel hasn't wrestled in, geez, o- over 10 years now. Um, he uh, is almost 50 years old because um, he's several years older than Danielson, I believe. Uh, he he took a photo of himself in ring gear from last year Ramblin, and he looked like he was in great shape. I have zero doubt, Kevin, zero doubt that the match would be great. Um, <laughs> I don't I have, know. I'm dubious about I it. I have I been, I have a list of people who have 
expressed skepticism or doubt or disdain for that match. I don't think I should be on that list, but I'm sure that I am. Um, I can look it up right now because I have a whole <laughs> spreadsheet. It's called People Who Disrespected Nigel. And it's about 30 names deep uh, on here. But Kevin, you are not on it. Oh, no. Yes, you okay. are. Yeah, no, uh, sorry. I lied. You are. You're number 19. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm waiting for them to have a minimum four and a half star match at Wembley Stadium that everyone is talking about. Uh, so I can, you know, exact my revenge and take my victory lap on it. <laughs> um, and you will not be alone because there are many people that have uh, I've been dubious of this match. How how dare they? Um, <laughs> but that is the match that I obviously want to see. That's obviously kind of like I would say that kind of like a pipe dream match. There are many reasons why that match might not take place. Um, but we're talking about like things he hasn't done. Obviously, he's wrestled Nigel a lot, but this has the potential to be an intensely personal feud. I've our I've already fantasy booked it, even though I hate fantasy booking. I've already got the angle of Nigel requesting the match and Danielson turning him down, saying you're not on his he's not on his level and he's afraid he's gonna hurt Nigel. And then Nigel obviously going heel and beating the crap out of Danielson, who and, and Nigel's been planting the seeds on commentary since he's started working for the company. Um, so basically we're both just we both figured out different ways to rebook the Ric Flair. <laughs> yes, the Terry Ric Funk angle. I mean, is that the worst idea, Kevin? Shouldn't most shouldn't like 95% of the angles <laughs> just be like a version of that? Um, I'm with you for sure, 100. I definitely think that they should try. And again, it's it's uncertain due to his health status, which appears to still be in question. But they, sh I would really like them to see to see Danielson Omega again. Like, yeah, I mean, really... I'm surprised that they never did that again. I mean, um, that's a lot of things about you know the way Kenny Omega has been used in AEW, and yeah. obviously injuries and things like that have have taken their toll and. Uh, it's it's unclear when you know this difficult difficult I can I'm not even gonna try to pronounce it. Um, diverticulitis. Thank you. I could say it if I said deep sea diverticulitis. If I say the whole Excalibur <laughs> yeah. uh, phrase, I can't for say it. anything else on this podcast. Yeah. But I can do diverticulitis. Um, you know when that gets cleared up, if Kenny is going to be back by the end of this year, I think it doesn't seem like it seems like kind of anything is possible in terms of his recovery. Right. Um, and I mean that first match. When it was announced, I was thinking about going to that show anyway. And then, but I wasn't really sure because of, of just personal stuff that was going on and work and stuff. And mm -hmm. when they announced that match, I was like, I'm making this happen. I'm going. And he, I did. Um, it was awesome. Yeah. And, and, and like that match is one of my five favorite matches in AEW history, which is it got so, so much company. It's so hard to pick a favorite match. Right. Um, and and on that thing with me with Brian Danielson and his run there, I don't even think that that that's probably not one of my top five Brian Danielson matches. Although I have to think about it, and that's not a slight on the match. No, at all. It's, it's totally just how defensible. much I've loved, how like so much of his other stuff. I think have just been unbelievable. Yeah, the, everything about that match, like it's it kicks off the show, big bell pop, huge audience, crowd super into it. They have this 30-minute match. Oh, yeah, match. the crowd was unbelievable. They have this 30-minute match that's just, just a breeze. Like, they they felt like they left so much on the table. They they do the draw. Nothing has been settled. Like, that probably should have just been a series of matches. In hindsight, it's a shame it wasn't. But that is obviously yeah. something that I think everyone would be super interested in seeing at some point. Again, it a lot of it seems to depend on when Kenny is going to be able to come back. But if when he is able to come back, no risks – the first match should be that match. Yeah, and then and then it's just dickhead Brian Danielson kicking Kenny Omega <laughs> in the intestines. He's working the intestines. I mean, how many Let's matches go. have we seen that? You know, everyone works <laughs> the knee or the arm or the neck or the back. It's like, let's work that small intestine. Yeah. Um, I see it perfectly in my mind, and now I just desperately want to see it. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're getting him versus Osprey. Um you know, you look at that AEW roster. Have we scunned him versus Swerve? I was actually just, as you were thinking about that, I feel like they've done it. I can't remember. I feel like they did it, but if they did it, it was just on a Dynamite or something. Yeah. But I don't even, I can't even tell you for sure. But it feels like to me they did, but I'd have to look it up for sure. It's If they did, it's not one of the top ones that I remember. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's obviously one. You oh, could they could do him do. versus Joe? Him versus Joe. I mean, he could wrestle literally anyone on the company, including right. people he's wrestled right. before, and it would be awesome. I mean, right. his match versus MJF is one of my favorite matches in AEW history. 
Yeah, I mean, it's the best Iron Man match of all time. And that's, oh, that's that's one thing, too. We talk about his versatility, and I don't even think we really talked about that one, but he took a he took a, 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 a match stipulation that is very difficult to make it interesting the whole time, and he's a, he was able to do it in a very interesting way where the entire time my eyes were glued on the screen, like I was paying attention to every single minute of the match, and he was just unbelievable. And then they, by the end of the match, the crowd is going absolutely bananas for everything. And it's just, again, it's a testament to it. I mean, uh, like I, I haven't, I don't, that's not the best match of the past five years or anything or like ever. And it wasn't even my match of the year last year, but it, I hadn't felt that way watching a match where I was glued onto every single screen uh, or every single moment on the screen since that uh, two out of three falls Okada versus Omega match, which mm-hmm. like, it's not my favorite match of all time. And, like, I don't – when I say greatest match of all time, like, I think of matches not that one. But really, I think there is a strong contender that that Kenny Omega versus Okada match is the greatest match of all time. And, like, I haven't felt that way. Watching that MJF Danielson match brought back the same feelings I had watching that other match. Yeah, I mean, that Revolution show is probably my favorite show in AEW history just because the Moxley, so. versus, the Moxley versus Hangman match is so insanely great. And that, yeah, was, that like, was my match of the year last year. Yeah. And that was like, how can, how can that not be the main event? It's going to be so hard to follow this MJF versus Danielson Iron Man match. Oh man, they've got their work cut out for them. And the fact that the MJF and Danielson match to me was just as good. Uh, and in a totally, totally, totally different match. Uh, yeah. And just... both have blood and stuff. And like, I love blood. Obviously I'm not trying to be like the blood guy, but like it's hard to have two bloody matches on the same show stand out in completely different ways yeah and I, i've whenever i've heard you know people have some criticisms for that danielson mjf match um and i always fall back on and this is an original thought i had but someone said it and i apologize for not knowing who it is but like can we not overthink because people say like oh danielson didn't sell this and sell that and the you know there's just no urgency or things like that and i say i always say like let's not try to overthink a match that had uh, a sold out audience standing and clapping for a, a, a half crab at like the 59 minute mark. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you. I am a like big what, picture wrestling fan. Yeah, like, like I don't, I don't like, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before. I try not to pick apart the small things. Those aren't really, if a move looks bad, I don't really care. Like, you know, within a match, if they could figure it out or whatever, like it doesn't bug me. I'm a big picture guy. So I completely, I agree. Yes them standing and going crazy at the end of the match is more important than, Oh, this guy didn't sell this or he <laughs> no sold. He yeah. was, he was limping this second and wasn't limping this other second. Like I, I yeah. that doesn't at, at the end of like a five hour wrestling show too. Right. Right. It's like midnight Eastern time. And they just watch this hour long match and they're hopping for a move that hasn't finished a match uh, in 65 years. Yeah. Um, Lance storm, not included. Um, but yeah, so that's um, that's pretty much all I have. I I didn't. This is totally off topic, but I uh, I did not watch really. I didn't really watch WrestleMania. Have Have you seen any of WrestleMania? I was there. Okay, so you were there, nights. right? Because yes. you're a Philly guy, right? Yes. Um, so that's great. Um, what were your takeaways from WrestleMania? Real quick, this again is a, a bo- some bonus audio here. Yeah, yeah. So I did do I did seven shows over the weekend. So I was at like some of the indie ones in Ring of Honor and stuff. Actual WrestleMania, I don't watch too much WWE. I was there with WWE. Like, well, I say WWE fans. Like the the person I was with was one of my best friends, and he's a big wrestling guy. Like he watches everything. So it's not like he's a uh one of the like we think of WWE fans who only watches it, but he really likes it. What's going on right now? So I felt kind of crazy with our back and forth. We are so far apart on a lot of WWE stuff right now that it made me question things sometimes. But um, I thought that night one was like, okay. I thought that the Rhea and Becky match was good and the Gunther versus uh, Sami Zayn match was good. Although uh, not even out of WWE thing, I think that both of them would have a better match in a different era of WWE, like re- of recent era, it, it it wasn't like the peak of what that match could have been, but like it was still good. I thought that night two, uh, I thought the main event was pretty bad and boring. Um, if you condense that into like 15, 20 minutes, I think I accept it, but like 45 minutes, it just felt very long when you mm-hmm. kind of knew what the 
what was going to happen there. What was the heat like for that match? Because that's one of the few matches I have seen. I watched the Uso brothers match. I watched the main event from night one. I watched the Sami Zayn Volter match, and I watched the main event from night two. That is um, all I've seen from WrestleMania. It's probably yeah. all I'm going to see. Um, so, but what I was think... the heat like for that main event on night one? Because when I was watching that, I was blown away by until really until like The Rock is going for the people's elbow on Cody. Like really out to that point, I was shocked at how little the crowd seemed to be into the match, given, you know, obviously how hot the build was and how into the rock they were and how the television audience is reacting to everything. What was kind of the experience live? So there was I, I there was not really too much of a reaction to Cody versus Roman in that match. There was when Cody and the rock got in. Uh, there was a big reaction for that. And then the match was so long, it kind of just all peaked out, uh, petered out. Um I think in hindsight, I the the match the next day was very hot. Like the crowd was very pro Cody, very anti Roman. Like even though there are tons of Roman fans in the crowd, like there that I saw, like it was very. The crowd was the main event on night one made you question what the reaction would be on night two, but night two was the reaction was like what you would want it to be. Mm -hmm. Like the crowd was very pro Cody. And what I realized, what I I've thought about this afterwards, and I'm pretty sure that the that they just wanted the Cody versus Roman match. They didn't want another match before that. Like I don't think they really bought into the stipulation of it, and I think that they just like didn't. They just saw the the, the tag match the night before as like a gateway to the match they actually wanted to see. Yeah. So like. That that checks I haven't out discussed to me. that with anybody, but that's just like thinking about it. It's like, okay, the match night two was hot. The match night one wasn't. They wanted Cody to win, and there were no real stakes to night one. Like, I who cares? Who really cares about the bloodline rules part, right? Like, I'm sure some people bought into it, but like, it doesn't really matter, right? That match doesn't really matter. It's just shoehorned into night one. I think if you have a different main event night one, like not related to the Cody universe, it probably is hotter. But yeah, well, I, I think I think that makes a lot of sense because I think the fans were into seeing the rock and they yeah. were into like, like I said, when he went for the people's elbow, they all stood up and all cheered and things like that. But they were not interested in the actual wrestling match at all. Right. Because in like the you night said, two, they were. You're like, yeah, like you said, they kind of saw that as just like unnecessary preamble to getting to night two yeah. um if they had done a stipulation where like cody needs to win the match or he doesn't get his title shot or something like that it might have been different but because like nobody bought the stipulation of like we know that the rock is going to get involved in in the match somehow on night two so like the idea of like oh the bloodline will be banned from ringside and things like that the fans weren't into that and the, the match was long and plotting and it was punch kick and it was a lot of the things i don't like about wwe's main event style these days um and it just killed the crowd i know people were saying like it was cold which i, I suppose it was but it was cold but it wasn't that cold like I, I mean, you're you're at an event, outdoor event in Philadelphia. Like, does yeah, anyone, people do, know? What, yeah, like, what's do people on. go to Eagles playoff games and be like, "Oh, it was quiet because it was cold." It was like yeah. if anything, it makes and people like, louder and more energized. Like it was cold, but I've been to way colder things. Like I, I was layered up. I had a jacket on. I was fine. Yeah, so, it was like, like in like really the high thirties, low forties. Yeah, I, I would probably like forties, fifties. Yeah, so I don't even know. Maybe it was the thirties, but like I don't know. It didn't even feel that cold to me. Yeah, so that's yeah. that was something I was like, well, the crowd was cold, and it's like, 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 I don't know, it's a sporting event in Philadelphia. Like, those fans are used to, like, it's not like a bunch of, I know people fly in, but it's not like a bunch of people flew in from Florida wearing Hawaiian shirts right. and, and, and right. you know, khaki shorts and sandals. Right. Um, and I, I did I did think night two was better than night one. I thought that it was overall, most of it was good. The street fight wasn't very good, but, like, the rest of it I thought was good. You didn't buy event, it as a I tribute to ECW? <laughs> I, I knew that the Philadelphia street fight was going to happen, but I thought it was going to be the Usos match. And the fact that the Usos match was not, and it was what it was, and then this match was, the like the street fight that was, ended up being that, it was just 
so weird. Yeah, the Usos match was the first match I saw because when people were talking about it, I was intrigued by how bad it could be. Right. Because yeah. I was like, if you were to ask me, like, what would be the the like the over under cage match rating for that match before it took place, I would probably say like seven. And right. it was like a two. Right. Uh, even by current cage match standards which is very uh seems to be very forgiving towards wwe so i was fascinated by like, what actually happened in this match how could it be this bad and you know like rich crage was telling me like it should be studied how bad it was um and when you mentioned the brian danielson ricky stark strap match earlier about like danielson steps into that match like essentially no builds um and just like right from the get-go it has the intensity of this blood feud um and in kind of how he's able to sell the intensity of the match despite there being really no build or really no story between the rivalry between brian Danielson and ricky starks and they're having what is essentially usually a blow-off match um and like i was thinking when you mentioned that like how that was like the complete opposite of the usos match which is a match with like despite having this incredibly long build that dates years and years and years back um that they had this match that didn't have the like uh action and intensity of a match that sh it should have had and what that says about the usos as wrestlers and what it says about brian danielson as a wrestler it's just kind of something right. that stands out um, right Oh, this was a talking point. I forgot. We're, we're, I'm switching away from WrestleMania because I forgot to bring this up. But this is a very key point of Brian Danielson I wanted to ask you. Is is Brian Danielson the most beloved wrestler of the 21st century? Mm, I think that that's... Who doesn't like him? Think. And, and yeah, how I mean... And how remarkable is that of an achievement in this era where people are ridiculous online and everyone has a bunch of haters and yeah, he jumped from WWE to AEW, which should be like a Cardinal sin. And he doesn't fit the Vince McMahon mold of wrestler and online fans have been obnoxious about supporting him throughout the years. Yeah. Like despite all of that working against him, he just, he seems to be beloved by literally everyone. I think that that's probably true. I mean, I'm trying to think of other guys. And like I was thinking, you know, John Cena and like John Cena now, like obviously when he was a wrestler, he was very divisive. I think most people have come around to John Cena now. Well, and he might guys be like, more beloved in the sense like there's just people that absolute more people that absolutely love John Cena than anyone else. Right, but right. just someone right. who even, has like universal approval. Right. right I, I I more so mean I don't think there's as many Cena detractors these days as there were. Um no, because we saw that what was what came after him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, that's a different topic of John Cena kind of being one of the more underrated WWE wrestlers ever, but that's a completely different thing. Oh, I but, agree. Uh, I agree with yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, of course, cause Boston. But uh, no, no, as someone that yeah, genuinely yeah, like wrote a lot of negative, like I'm bored of John Cena pieces, right? In my time, like I wrote an article for Wrestling Inc. like back in like 2018, 2019, and it was like right when he kind of stepped away from wrestling, and I was like. Um, you know, I was like, we miss John Cena. Like, yeah, like he made everything feel important, even if he won yeah. a lot. And when he feuded with somebody, it felt important. And now we're, yeah. you know, watching Baron Corbin and Seth Rollins feud. Yeah, there's some real duds for Cena, but there's some real highs too. But yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a guy like Sami Zayn, you know, who I don't think has has any real detractors or anything. But like Danielson. Ugh, I want to say that Danielson is at a bigger level than than Sami Zayn, even though it's hard to say with current WWE, you know. But like, I think in general too, like if you look at just like fans and then online fans, how people consider him, like you know, in like the PWO era where like they're do they're doing greatest wrestler ever all uh, this time, and like Danielson, it's probably a year or two, and I think that Danielson has a real shot to be number one, and like. You know, and then there's just the AEW fans love him and the WWE yeah. fans love him. Even so the crank, I, even, yeah, like you used to mention, like the PWO, not to lump everyone there, but even like the cranks like him. Yeah. Like the yeah. people that and are like, grumpy and hate, like even, even like your people that hate like the Young Bucks and the Flippy Doos and things like that. Like he, they all like Brian Danielson. He, yeah, I, he, it's, it's, it's incredibly remarkable. Like I don't know. Yeah. It's in a lot of I mean, it is like when, when so much, 
when it appears that so much of people's dislike of res a wrestler is out of the individual wrestler's control that are they're just right. in positions where they can't succeed because they work with a certain promotion or they supposedly have heat with some other wrestler that people like or whatever the, the reason is uh the fact that that danielson has just been so universally beloved i find very fascinating i think yeah. there is one guy who whose career uh mirrors brian danielson's in a lot of different ways who i think is close to his level in terms of just universal praise and that's aj styles true i was thinking aj too um as far as like a uh not the 21st century like i do see a lot of harry funk in in danielson and how mm -hmm. like he's presented how people like him how versatile he is like in a lot of ways danielson is kind of like the modern terry funk even though their styles are not completely similar although they're probably more similar than people would give them credit for but i i do see that there too but yeah i mean i think that aj styles is probably a good 21st century comparison yeah. but going back to it i think that that is a real testament too to danielson's uh versatility and and how he's able to do literally everything and make it work uh yeah and totally. it, i mean and like aj 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 to me is one of the only guys who can kind of match Danielson in terms of you mentioned like all the like all the the wrestlers like Danielson wrestled Triple H and he also wrestled um Blue Panther Necro Butcher and, yeah Necro Butcher and yeah when he said <laughs> Triple H and Necro Butcher and Brock Lesnar I was like I think AJ, I don't know if AJ ever wrestled Triple H yeah did, um, I don't did he ever wrestle Necro Butcher um I mean I want to say that that has to have happened but yeah, I am I now off has, to, I am off to cage match to find out but continue with your point <laughs> oh yeah I was just gonna say like uh. You know, there's going back. There, there's not many people have that long stretch of of uh, being considered one of the best. Being considered world. one of the best, yeah. But also, there's not many wrestlers that have that are as versatile as him in what their great matches are and how many great matches there are. And not even in the like. I think it's easier today have a great match like the the athletic um, ability is so high now that it's it, it's easy to have a great match. But there's not that many people over their career who have as many great matches in different ways than he does. Where, like, if I were to do greatest match ever, like, or sorry, greatest wrestler ever, and I would think, like, my strong contenders would be guys like Terry Funk, who Terry Funk has great matches all over the place, but Terry Funk is like the ultimate fives wrestler, right? He, he feels like, uh, you just watch, you just want to watch Terry Funk matches because it's Terry Funk. And he has plenty of great matches. Don't get me wrong. Then you have like another guy that I would consider is Kenta Kobashi's greatest wrestler ever. And he is so great as, you know, being the underdog, but also being the ace and always having a great match within the all Japan style or the Noah style. And if you look even at both of those guys, like Danielson, I think the way that he is versatile, he's, he's more versatile than Kobashi, even though Kobashi is just in a different, environment where he doesn't have to be as far as the the match types you know uh because of things are such so more compartmentalized in japan but still even terry funk like danielson is able to do everything that terry funk did the brawling the technical stuff the comedy stuff whatever and danielson probably does it does even more than him and probably has more good matches in whatever style than terry funk and probably has more Great matches to scale, like even beyond the fact that like athleticism and stuff is higher now. Like, I, there's a real strong case that Daniel Bryan is the greatest wrestler of all time, just because of how much different stuff he is able to do in a great and convincing way. Like, I don't know if I would choose him as the greatest wrestler of all time. This is not necessarily an argument of saying like Daniel Bryan or Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson is the greatest ever. But if you look at what he's able to do. I mean, there is a real strong chance that he is the greatest ever. And if not, I mean, I think that anybody would have to have him at least top 10, maybe top five. I, I, I think it's just like, if you look like example, a contemporary, right, is Kenta. And Kenta could be considered people's like favorite wrestler ever. And he has this era of that's just like, you could say like watching Pete Kenta, you'd be like, that's the greatest wrestler I've ever seen. His 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 peak is like eight years at most, maybe, you know, like and you look at Danielson and what he's doing now, it's like 
it's so crazy and so good still. It's just like, I don't know. I, it's, I, I it's, it's really hard to imagine somebody being better than him. Yeah, I don't know. I really have to think about it. Yeah. I always, it's really hard. Like I, I actually, I, I could never do like the, the exercise of like, who is the greatest wrestler of all time? And then try right. to also be somewhat objective about it just right. because and, and I and, and I think that's I, why it's I, easier to do buckets than like this I, guy is actually. Right? Yeah, I love so many wrestlers in different ways. Um, right. That's hard. Like even like you're talking about like that Danielson has greater diversity and stuff than than, than Terry Funk does. And I'm not disputing that at all. But it's like right, you know, Terry Funk's career started 60 years ago. Right, right, right. Like it's yeah, it's, like it's 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 hard, and it's hard. Like I've always even when comparing like. um you know, even when we talk about like wrestler of the year and things like that, when we're looking at wrestlers who are wrestling the same years, and it's depending on what kind of promotion you're in and the kind of opportunities you're given, it can be much easier, much more difficult to be wrestler of the year. And how do you factor that in? It's like any kind of sports conversation where it's like, when you're talking about like MVP and it's like, well, that guy, his team won 60, you know, it's, if it's the NBA, it'd be like that team, his team won 60 games. It's like, well, his team had more help. This guy whose team won 50 games you know, he was everything to that team. So he should actually be the MVP. And it's like, right. are, do you, you can credit guys for being, you know, like, I think like new Japan guys, um, especially in the last 10 years have had a big advantage because, you know, they have the G1 where they wrestle for the most part, like 10 other great wrestlers in high stakes singles matches. And that just allows them to pad their you know, their, their, their stats of how many great matches they had, how many four-star matches they had, et cetera, versus I think like, you know, certainly a WWE wrestler. And we can talk about Brian Danielson in WWE, like Brian Danielson wasn't having as many, you know, I think objectively great matches in WWE. Yeah. During I don't his think time there, then like, as... right. Then like, you know, Hiroshi Tanahashi was having a new Japan. I was like, does that mean that, Hiroshi Tanahashi is better than Brian Danielson, or is it because obviously Brian, Dan you know, Hiroshi Tanahashi was in a position where he was able to wrestle all these guys in high stakes matches. And right. it just, it's, it's, it's like a, it's, it's a dumb, it's like honestly like a dumb argument to have with any certainty. It's kind of yeah. fun to like, discuss, but like, we all right. know. Like, That's why I did feel like we were going like, we, I say we, but you and I were involved in the discussion, but just in general too, I did feel, you know, going in circles about the Osprey versus Danielson argument. Cause it's exactly what, you're saying like we're never going to find the common ground because we're evaluating it slightly different ways and what we're valuing is slightly different. But I think it was, you know, it's important that people understand like this is how I'm coming approaching this. And like, you know, the Osprey arguments, I completely understand and I respect and I, I get why people would think that way. But I just want to say, hey, this is why I think Brian Danielson is the is the wrestler of the year because of why he, he's able to do these things well. I think better than anybody else, but yeah, it does feel, it certainly feel, can feel circular at some points. Yeah. And especially because this is a problem with many, many different, pretty much every art form is like um, subjectivity and then trying to come up with a way to quantify said subjectivity in some sort of way. And it's just, it's just like impossible. Like I enjoy, like I'll, like I said this, like a year or two ago and, and people were surprised that I said it, but I was like, to me, if like, who, who is a better wrestler, Kenny Omega or Brian Danielson? I'm like, Kenny Omega blows Brian Danielson away. Okay. That's just the way I feel. But I think a huge reason for that is just me as a wrestling fan. Like I love athleticism. I love explosiveness. That's the kind of action that I love to see more than anything else. Um, Other people feel differently. They value other things. And I can't really have like a like a like a argument where we're gonna argue over like this like it's an objective point, right? And right. some people do try to get into that position where it's like, well, obviously you only value this and I value that, and what I value is more important. It's like it's just it it really is just taste, right? That's all right, it right. is. Like some people are gonna like different things. Now, there's there's that, and then so so it's it's you can't. Um, you can't like uh, really have like that in depth of an argument, and of course, there's there's also a level of ups of relative um, uh, understanding that you can reach with somebody. Like I personally think saying I think Kenny Omega is better than Brian Danielson 
is a, even if you totally disagree with me, is at least a understandable point, as opposed to if I said, like, I think The Miz is better than Brian Danielson, <laughs> which is like, I would listen to the argument, but I would need to hear it. I, I would right, need but, to... like, there's an element of, <laughs> it's like, it's not like you can't, like, we obviously can't determine who's right or wrong, but we also right. have an understanding of, like, what is an, a truly absurd yeah. point versus what is yeah. just a matter right. of taste. I'm approaching the Omega argument as, like, okay, give me your points, and I'm approaching The Miz argument is you're really going to have to sell me on this one brother i i would be approaching the biz argument as been like oh so have you <laughs> like never watched any wrestling before right, right, outside right, of like right. the wwe or whatever um right. but yeah um is there anything else on brian danielson that we haven't gotten to i think i've gotten over all my my talking points i had in my head before the show started uh i don't know i i really uh, i guess just to wrap it up i mean like I really do, like I said, I, I think that he's really one of the best wrestlers of all time. I, I I almost want to just go see who else has like resumes, not even of great matches, but just like who they've wrestled. Like he's really wrestled everybody that you could think of. And like and and you know, just to repeat and say the same things over and they're it's good every time. But yeah, I mean, I think that he's a real I, I don't want to say that he's like a a, a lost lost breed or whatever of, of wrestler, but like it's just like it's not even that because like I don't even know in other ears there's guys like him. He's just a complete one of one. Yeah, just you, like... to be honest, something that I noticed, which was kind of when I was especially when I was watching like some of his earlier matches, and I was like, who are his real inspirations? Because he doesn't really wrestle like like obviously like like if you think about like like Benoit is kind of like the god of of American in ring wrestling when he's breaking into the business. Right. Um, and there are some elements of Benoit to him, but he's a very different wrestler than Benoit. Right. There, there's Benoit elements. There's dynamite elements. There's Regal elements. There's yeah. you know, there's Regal all this stuff. Close. But... I hate William Regal. I'm sorry. I just have to say that. <laughs> um, but there are. Yeah. Obviously, Danielson's career is is somewhat tied to him. Yeah. But uh, I think really though, when you when you look at Danielson, I I think that you don't really see. Sp- Oh, okay. You do see specific guys. Like you do really do see Regal. And I think it's like, and, and the way that you see Regal, I don't think is like um, personified in Danielson. Oh, sorry. Let me, let me step back. I think Regal's influence in Danielson, you see it most in the way that Charlie Dempsey's Regal's son does not come off as a Regal cosplay. He comes off as a Danielson cosplay. Mm-hmm. And I don't necessarily know if that's on purpose or what, but like he feels way more like Danielson than he does Regal. And I think that that's just kind of a testament to like Regal's influence on Danielson because he took that style and like melded it into this own like more palatable thing. And then that's what his son, who's obviously trying to do that style, he's going to the well of Danielson more than he is the actual like inspiration for it, you know? So like, I, I, but I do think like in general, you don't see Danielson's influence. Like you, you don't see specific guys on him, but you just see like, okay, he's pulling stuff from the world of sports style. He studied that a lot. He's pulling stuff from Puro. He's pulling stuff from American wrestling. I mean, I, I, Obviously, like the idea of Shawn Michaels training him is overblown, but he still did learn from Shawn Michaels school with American wrestling and stuff. And he was in the WWE system in general. So really, when you look at Danielson, he's really like, it's not even like, oh, what's his influence? His influence is literally wrestling. Like his influence is everything. And he's able to kind of take everything that he sees and put it into one package. And I think that that's really you know, we talk about the versatility a million times on the podcast already. Like that's why he's versatile is because he's looked at all of these things and he is able to understand and think about it all and mend it, meld it together beyond just like, Oh yeah, he rest, He watched a lot of dynamite kid matches. So now he's a dynamite kid ripoff. Like he's not doing that. He's able to take elements of what dynamite kid is doing and elements of that general style and just meld it with lucha or brawling or whatever he's doing and and then the final product is brian danielson yeah i I think he's closer to bret hart than he is to almost anyone else i think i think so too and oh just one little point that doesn't that i was thinking about is like uh you talk about 
both Bret Hart, like, you know, not, not known as a promo guy. And sometimes people say he's a bad promo and sometimes people say he's a good promo, but what he is, is he's a Bret Hart promo, right? Like he is good at being Bret Hart and whether or not that is a good promo or a bad promo, it's Bret Hart, right? And you buy it because it's him. And Brian Danielson is the same thing throughout his career. He's been called a good promo, a bad promo, but now that we can kind of look at most of his career in hindsight, He's Brian Danielson. It the the he's a convincing character. Exactly right. Yeah. The the conventions of what a good or bad promo are don't matter anymore because it's Brian Danielson, and you're watching a Brian Danielson promo, and that's it. Maybe he'll start laughing in it. Maybe he'll forget his lines or get flustered or whatever. It doesn't matter. Like it, it's not conventionally good. Sometimes, sometimes it can be conventionally bad, but it doesn't matter because he's Brian Danielson, and he's. You buy it, and that's who he is. And I think that that kind of, again, it just kind of sums up why he's able to work. Whatever he's doing, you just believe that it's him. And so, like, it just it just all makes sense. He's this melting pot of wrestling. It's, it's kind of crazy when you think about it like that, but I really do. Like, he just has – he's been a sponge of everything, and he's been able to take everything that he's ever seen and kind of present it in a, in a convincing way. And that's why he's so good. Yeah, I, I do think we have seen, we obviously haven't seen another Brian Danielson. I do think his influence you see in some guys, I think Kyle O'Reilly is someone who I think is very similar to Brian Danielson in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. a Garcia. Lot of that, yeah, Daniel Garcia, Lee, Mor Lee Moriarty is another one. I think, I think. And like I said, of, Charlie Dempsey, I think I, I the matches I've seen with him yeah. this year, I just go like, oh yeah, he's doing, they want you to think he's doing Regal, but he's doing danielson he's doing like regal through the lens of brian danielson yeah. like yeah, yeah yeah he um i i and part of that is like i think danielson's like danielson was kind of a like a, like kind of like an early adopter of some of the like mma influence stuff like we're gonna get on the map we're gonna grapple i'm gonna wear kick pads i'm gonna kick you in the chest like that kind of stuff that i think right. would have happened anyway but because danielson was an early adopter he kind of comes across as one of like the the first guys kind of to do that kind of style of pro wrestling. Um, but it's obviously, you know, I, you would think that someone with this is, and this probably makes him the most special of anything is that someone with his limited physical gifts is how I'll say it. You would think would be much more easier to copy, right? It's hard to right. copy the rock. It's hard to right. copy Dave Batista because right. it's just a very short amount of people that look like that. But Brian Danielson has a has because he's not particularly big and because he's not particularly super athletic, like you would think would be someone that a lot of wrestlers could copy themselves after. And we would see all these Brian Danielson clones everywhere, but we don't. And it's because his brilliance is very, very, very hard to replicate, uh, almost more so than there are than, than than any physical skill or physical ability that another wrestler would have. Right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it goes back to what was said in the very beginning of the wrestling charisma. He just has this unique thing that nobody else can replicate like you see people doing this stuff all the time but like it just doesn't it doesn't come off the same way as him and that's just there's some guys michael jordan a million people every kid try to copy michael jordan nobody's ever able to do it because it's michael jordan same thing with brian danielson i mean you anybody could try to, to capture him but he's brian danielson and he's just like I said, I, I I don't want to say he's the greatest wrestler of all time, but he's say he's it. in the say conversation. It, Kevin. Say it, say it out loud. <laughs> all right, he's the greatest wrestler of all time. But uh, but yeah, like how I, how dare you? <laughs> but like th that's why you know he's he just has the thing, the competitive thing. But he's instead of the competitive athlete gene came to Brian Danielson, who's a wrestling nerd. So nerd. So instead of like uh wanting to win as many titles or whatever, he put that gene into being as great of a wrestler as he possibly could. And it's just like, it's the same thing as the Brian Jordan, uh, Brian Jordan, Michael Jordan, Brian uh, Jordan, great two sport. Brian athlete. Jordan. Yeah. yeah the Atlanta Braves as a, as a Phillies guy, you know, I wasn't a Brian Jordan fan, but uh, uh, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, like it's the same thing as those guys. It's just Tom Brady. It's the same thing as that, except it just happened to be put into a wrestling nerd and not, not a, a peak athlete. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you have anything you want to plug that we haven't done gone over yet? 
No, just the only thing is uh, Wrestling 101. Uh, if you're not familiar, it's just me and Robin Reed from Voice of Wrestling. We had discussion a, a while ago at this point about just, you know, making a list of the 101 wrestling matches that we think any uh, fan should see. Uh, these are not necessarily the greatest matches of all time, although there are plenty of them are the greatest matches of all time. But we just think there are 101 matches that kind of uh, kind of paint a picture of what wrestling is that we think, you know, are either canonized or there's something specific within the match that has been influential or important or iconic or whatever. And, and uh, the list is not meant to be in this all encompassing serious thing, but it's just 101 matches that uh, people should, that resonate and people should see. So we're in the middle of that now. It, it's been a very long project. I think at this point it's been going on for, I probably two years, I think at this point um, we're getting through it. I think we're probably in the fifties or sixties, but I cannot remember. Uh, we have another article coming soon. It's being finished up now. We have some fun guests on it. Like uh, I'll spoil that. We got Roy Lucia writing about uh, the uh, mask first match mask uh, world's collide match. That'll be in that next one. So like, uh, the the project is, is slow. It goes up and down with when with life, but uh, we're still making our way through it, and I, I, it's been a real fun, rewarding thing. And and I think that it's kind of a, I kind of view it as I, I my my legacy in wrestling is very 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 small. But uh, if this is what it ends up being, uh, that's I think it's a cool contribution. So check that out, Voice of Wrestling. Uh, we're recording this in beginning of April, twenty twenty four, and. We should hopefully have the, the next article out in the next week or two or so. So hopefully knock on wood. So, yeah, that that's the only thing. Uh, I mean, I, I'm on Twitter and Instagram and stuff, but I, I'm barely on both those places. So I won't even give my uh, my ads at this point. But just check me on Voice of Wrestling and I'm in the Voice of Wrestling Discord sometimes. So check me out in there and, and hit me up there. And, and yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, I want to thank Kevin for joining the show. I want to thank all of our listeners who continue to make this show such a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, on my end, I love getting such positive feedback for everyone uh, and negative feedback because, you know, that helps us be better. Um, but appreciate it, and I'll talk to everyone again after a while. Thanks. My name is Tyler Fornis, and I am one of the co-hosts of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungi AEW podcast here on the Voice of Wrestling Podcasting Network. We take a broad scope approach to the world of All Elite Wrestling and the entire universe of Tony Khan. We talk about the big matches, the big stars, the promos, the storylines. And we also look at it from a big picture perspective. How are things going to change over the course of the next 10 years with AEW still in the picture? How are companies like WWE going to adapt and adjust to AEW, and are they going to be a similar way like they did with WCW in the late 1990s? Will there be a counterpunch? We talk about all of that and more on the good, the bad, and the hungry every week on the Voice of Wrestling Network.